Ramble On, talking media to death and diving into spoilers with Brendan and Nick, an autopsy for the sinners and ascension for the saints of film and television. Like the intro says, we're in the Ramble On! Hell yeah! Let's ramble! I'm Nick. I'm Brendan. Let's talk about the Twilight Zone reboots. Alright, so, first episode gave me personally uh, a bad first impression. I, I'm not sure I want to go episode by episode. Uh, Though there will be a section later where I do kind of want to dissect them all, but we'll do we'll do that later. Good call. Later on. Good call. Uh, in the meantime, though, let's just get through our talking points, talk about things that bother us about these episodes, and why, yeah, at least for me, I'm not the biggest fan of this series. Nor I. Uh, all right, so first things first, let's go ahead and talk about one of the... Uh, the themes of these episodes. Now, this is the Twilight Zone, and every episode has its own kind of little moral bow that it wraps everything up with. Sometimes <laughs> that racism is bad. Sometimes that uh, being unfunny can lead to you losing your losing everyone you love. Sometimes that means uh, some of the other episodes, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, generally, I think that for at least five of the six episodes we looked at, the twist didn't really work, in part because it's something that happened during the episode. Something where you say, huh, that's a little bit weird. Like, uh, for example, using the first episode as an example for this, uh, the, the lesson of the episode is, of course, you can either have everything you want, but lose everything you love, or you can give it all up in the name of saving what you had. <laughs> Except, during the episode, there's a part where he uh, takes one of the hecklers in the audience learns their name, learns their job, and makes them disappear, and has a successful act. I remember me, that. Which makes me think, like, well, if you can do that, there's a lot of loopholes you can get out of this deal with the devil thing. Right, I mean, if you could do that with hedge fund managers and replace them with a hot girlfriend for the other guy that was with them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just keep deleting audience members. That's fine. I know, you don't have to be incredibly selective with the targets. I mean... Uh, but, or like, uh, there's sometimes there's also themes where it kind of comes out of a different field, and you're like, oh, I didn't think this was going there. And it doesn't work in those cases. Like, uh, I want to talk about episode three, which is the, um, the, the one with the cop where she's taking her kid to college, and the cop keeps showing up wherever yeah. they go. And then, like, and like, you know, she keeps going back in time, and throughout the episode we see, oh, he's getting killed in worse and worse ways. Oh, this is getting really bad for him and her. How is she going to fix this? And the answer is... Record the police because uh, it's a Black Lives Matter thing. Uh, uh, but yeah, I think that generally, if we're talking about the kind of the, the twisty theme of the episode thing, by and large, it doesn't work. There's no. at least one episode where it sort of works, but only because it's one where it's actually foreshadowed and not just out of nowhere. Which is, I think, the latest episode, episode six, which is the astronaut episode. Uh, that's one where the, the kind of twist thing for it, which is that it was aliens all along kind of works for it. it that one kind of did yeah it, it works okay but still not like a strong Twilight Zone episode or even a strong Black Mirror episode it's it's a nice in between you know I mean of the six episodes you watched so far I definitely enjoyed six more because the twist actually and, worked and I want to warn people now I'm going to talk about Black Mirror constantly when comparing these shows because Black Mirror is very much the modern Twilight Zone and much better than the modern Twilight Zone. It's <laughs> it's kind of this curse with CBS All Access, where these shows that are on CBS All Access have better versions of that show that aren't called that show. Like uh, Star Trek Discovery, uh, The Orville exists, and it's a better Star Trek. Uh, Twilight Zone, Black Mirror exists, and it's a be it's a better Black it's a better Twilight Zone. How, how much of it do you think is studio based? Uh, I, I think part of it is that CBS is just one channel. It one is. studio, and they don't have the budget that big companies like Netflix or Hulu or these kind of companies that can make their own original stuff have. Right. So they're really running into problems of launching their independent streaming service way too early. And that's apparent. And, have, and having a lot of faith in the recognizable brand names, but not bringing the quality that comes with them. Right. They should just, they should have just stuck to sitcoms, in my opinion. <laughs> they, they should have just stuck to having a presence on like Netflix or Hulu and putting their resources into a high quality show instead of having um trying to launch a full service of their own like they didn't have the resources yet for it right but th that's prediction that's not actually a dissection of the past and we're talking about the toilet zone 
Yes. Uh, so, real quick, let's get into the effects of it, which is, you know, the, the, the props, the, the setting, the everything else. Uh, I feel like it looks cheap. It, it looks a little cheap, like Nick said it. Uh, the American Recut. In the American Recut. Uh, they only seem to stick to a few rooms. You know, it's like the whole shooting for each episode is exclusively in two, three rooms, and that's it. Yeah, do you think it's just a problem with the budget where they kind of didn't get the budget they need for a Twilight Zone reboot? I totally, I, I think that might be the problem. Because, I mean, most of, so take episode three, uh, the racist episode. Uh, it takes place at, in the diner, off the highway somewhere, and near the, in a small town near the university. So, I mean, three specific recurring settings again and again. Uh, yeah, I think that for the X's where there are multiple settings, it's always an outside shot or it's a, a uh, on-site shot. And you can tell with those ones because they didn't have to build a set for it. They just kind of went to the place and shot it. Yeah. And that those at least are a good way to get multiple shots if you're being cheap with it. But mm. also I think you need to be careful saying the racist episodes because there's a lot of those. So far, almost every episode deals with some aspect of someone being a little bit racist. Really? Well, okay, maybe in the first... And Five maybe episodes. the sixth. The sixth one, yeah, that... The sixth one didn't really go into racist stuff much. Except it kind of did. Did... Really? A little bit? I, I, I don't know. That, that's one the fifth I, one? That's when I have to read a little bit too hard. Uh, the fifth one, that was the child president one. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes. Depends on how you read it for that one. Like, if you're talking about like the the, the the white mother with the meet your manager haircut, who's saying, "My son is a perfect little boy. I won't reel him in." Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, you could argue that she's not trusting the the campaign manager because he's kind of a, he looks like he's Indian in descent. Mm. That's a stretch, though. That is a stretch. It, it is more apparent in some of the other episodes, like episode two, where the whole point of the episode is uh, our guy being kind of racist. He goes for first the guys who were sheep Muslims, then he goes for the Russians, and he trusts this white guy next to him implicitly, and he's like, oh, the white guy's a bad guy. I, okay, so was he be? I don't think he was being racist, but what the Indians thought he was probably being racist. Uh, uh, um, I, think, I, 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 think, I, think, I think he was being racist because when he hears, like, oh, the plane's going to go, he immediately assumes, oh, it must be the Muslim guys. No, okay, it's not them. It must be the Russian guy. No, it's not him. It must be the, <laughs> the, the, the kind of Asian looking uh, airline assistant. No, it's not her. What about this white guy who's saying some really cryptic stuff? I can probably trust him. <laughs> okay, you know what? That's a good point. But... And, and the first episode, one of the bad guys of the episode is this f f fat, drunken, racist lout of a white guy who's constantly telling racist jokes, who apparently was a rapist and killed some people at a bus stop. Yeah, yeah, he's crude, crass, and just all around and, and, and deplorable. The other, and the other bad guy of the episode is a uh, very hot, haughty uh, white guy who is constantly crushing on this guy's wife. Oh, the mentor, or the, yeah, the creepy teacher, yeah, yeah. The, one of those bald guys who, you know, who's got that real... Hey, Vsauce Michael here, look. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> that, yeah. Uh, and then episode three is, of course, the, the big race episode. Yeah. Uh, episode four, what was the, oh yeah, that was the one about the Inuits, where the, the bad guy was, was uh, kind of the alien guy, kind of the the, the the white guy who was saying like, God bless America and all these colonies that we fight to protect Christmas on. This, this our most precious of Christian holidays that we only worship here in the North Pole. Screw this in you with woman, I've got it. Yeah. And then that, I feel I feel like the table. Speaking of col colonial colonies and what have you, I feel like the tables were turned on that uh, captain because the aliens kind of colonized Earth. Starting with Alaska. <laughs> See, the thing is, they invade Earth, but it's kind of just this really liberated payoff of like, well, okay, yeah, he was probably an alien because, well, who's he going to be as a Twilight Zone? I, I, okay, and I saw that coming a mile away. Like, okay, guy in a nice suit appears randomly in a jail cell and no one knows where he comes from. Uh, alien! And with that, uh, let's get into the story a bit. And I want to get into a session I want to talk about, which is the, uh... The, the twist of the episodes, because while I was watching this, and I believe uh, you, you you may have had the same experience, yeah. while I was watching, I would usually come up with uh, these kinds of twists on, like, you know, oh, okay, what's the episode going to be about? What's the twist going to be? And I had the distressing problem of coming up with a better twist than the episode did most times. 
So if you don't mind, I do want to kind of go through these episodes, talk about my reasoning for these episodes and why I expected a better twist than what I got. Go for it. I'm kind of curious. Uh, yeah. Okay, so for episode one, we have uh, the comedian S- episode. The, 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 this is a classic Devil's Deal kind of episode. Uh, the original Twilight Zone from the 1950s did these episodes a lot, where the devil shows up, offers... Like, I can get you fame, fortune, but you have to talk about your loved ones and lose them. And he means that literally in this case, where every time he talks about something that he, that's in his life, it'll disappear. Total Midas touch kind of ordeal. Yeah. yeah. The, the place I thought this was going first was, okay, well, we know the history of Twilight Zone. We know these episodes often end with the main character commits suicide and the devil says, I always get that soul. And then that's how it usually ends for those old Twilight Zone episodes. Uh, There's one that I remember in particular, which is uh, a man who wishes that he was immortal. And the devil says, all right, you got it, buddy. And then the guy, like, you know, goes, well, commits suicide, sues people for fraud or for, like, uh, defective products when he just tries to kill himself with it and it doesn't work. (laughs) And just keeps on collecting on uh, life insurance policies over and over and over. And then at some point, like, he kind of grows numb to committing suicide, uh, he, like, kills his wife, and he's like, eh, whatever, at least she can die. And then he, uh, he gets sentenced to jail for life, and he's like, oh my god, I'll be here for all eternity, I can't possibly get out of jail, I want to revoke this deal with the devil. And then he immediately dies, and the devil's there, like, yep, I knew I'd get your soul eventually, dumbass. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we had this kind of episode with uh, this comedian take. And the the, the, the vibe with this episode is every time he talks about someone, they, they disappear. Yeah. Right. And it begins with, you know, his dog, then his nephew, which just killed really quick. I did not think it was going to go that quick. I, I thought, know. I thought it was going to be like, okay, he knows his dog went away. Maybe he'll talk about, like, uh, his favorite pen. And it's like, oh, I can't find my pen anymore. What's going on? But no, he just goes, we jump straight to, you deleted your nephew. <laughs> Oh, shit, you escalated this really fast episode. Where are you going with this? It really and then jumped. it didn't go anywhere with it, but... Um, where I thought this episode was going to go was... It was going to be one of those classic um, situations where he never learns his lesson and just keeps on banishing people away from reality over and over and over. And it's supposed to be an episode where the underlying theme is if you believe you're morally superior to everyone, you'll find yourself utterly alone in the world. And I thought that this would be an episode where the twist would be that whenever he sends someone away, they just go to kind of a parallel universe one one slide over where everybody he dismisses is in that universe and it rewrites itself to have what he lost in that first universe and you know, this kind of synchronous relationship between the two. So we would have the ending where he's wandering in a ghost town like nobody exists anymore. He's deleted everyone, but everybody's happy and doing well in the other the other world that he's not in. I, I would have appreciated that twist more, but so if I may interject real quickly, the problem with this particular episode is they heavily telegraphed how this episode could end. It could either go with him, like Nick said, deleting everyone from the face of the earth, or deleting himself and the latter happened rather than the former. And he, he deletes himself, and it's kind of a... It, it's, it's a delete, self-deletion where, unfortunately, with the way the episode is set up, it doesn't work as a twist quite, because no. one, there's definitely ways for him to get out of it. Two, uh, there's a point in the episode where, and I thought this was one of the most effective parts of the episode as is, which is where he gets up on stage and he, he does his horrible opening of well-regulated militia, yeah. and then... And then he, and then he kind of gets this line of, "No, you don't want that, do you? You need blood. You need fresh blood." And I thought this was like, "Oh, interesting. So this isn't really an audience. This is some kind of a judgment or damnation for him, where he has to sacrifice something, or he'll never get what he wants." Except other comedians exist, and they don't have to tell these uh, person deleting jokes. They just tell jokes, and they're funny. Yeah. And like, he's not at all. And this is a problem for the episode because it shows that. This isn't a demonic audience or a demonic situation. This is just him not him sucking as a comedian. Yeah. And on top of that, he's able to delete audience members and find a loophole. So he found a loophole to fix this whole problem. And you can't have that in your episode about somebody giving up the things they love to acquire fame because if there's a loophole, your metaphor falls apart. No, no, it really does. He should not have deleted those hedge fund managers because, uh, like you said, that it kind of exposes a loophole in this whole hocus pocus that he has. Uh, and then the other part of this episode too is this is a trend that shows up a lot in these episodes where it's kind of a he's brilliant because I say he's brilliant. And th- yeah. th- th- this is where um, in the show a lot of times 
the actions that these characters take or will do is we're told that they're brilliant people who are doing brilliant things, but every time they do them, they're not brilliant to the audience. Like, uh, the, the, the material this guy has is uh, supposedly too intelligent for, for people. Material is really lame material. Like, he talks about the Second Amendment and gun control, and uh, the way he tells it is this really hokey, terrible setup for it. Right. No, they, the, if I had to name a specific theme in this whole series, it's that, you know, the whole pride cometh before the fall thing, you know what I mean? Like, uh, oh. yeah. The second episode, the third episode, the third episode it took the main character, Nina, to finally admit that, yeah, I need my, fa I need help, and she goes back to her family, which she has put a great distance between. Uh, speaking of, second episode, uh, what would you say you thought the twist would be in the first two thirds of the episode? Who, uh, that the plane crashes or the plane ends up in a whole different parallel universe. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, well, the plane does crash, but they all perish, period. That's what I thought was going to happen. I mean, yeah, th th that's the one where Jordan Peele was like, oh, the twist is they all lived. Like, he thought that was the twist, but I had a little bit of a different take on it. You want to get to that one? Go ahead. All right, so th in this episode, during the, fir the opening scene, uh, it's established that we're in kind of the present or near future because he's got in AirPods, he's a famous journalist, he, there's, a, there's a sign in the background for a trip to Mars, uh, and when he gets on the plane, what he finds is uh, this uh, really old-looking MP3 player. It's got like a, it's got a manual scroll wheel for for its volume. It's got a aux port only. He, there's actively a scene where he reaches for his Air, AirPods and says, "Oh wait, this won't work. This thing is too old." Then he has to scratch in his his neighbor's seat for the headphones that go into it. Right? This is all stuff that's explicitly pointed out through the camera angles. So my, my thought was, oh, this is going to be a situation where he looks at this old podcast, very clearly an old one, right? It's yeah. an old podcast. It looks it, like a Zoom. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's an old Zoom. And he looks at this thing and says, oh my god, this must be what's happening now. But we, the audience, have evidence that no, this was clearly recorded years ago. This is an old recording about an old flight. This isn't your flight. You're just, uh, you're just assuming that the past is the present. Right. And that's a catchphrase that comes up on this episode is past is past. Past is past. Oh, yeah. So I, cool. I thought the twist would be, oh, well, okay, you're going to have a, have a coincidence where, oh, yeah, okay, you're clearly making things up and thinking that things are going to be like this. But the twist of the episode is just don't trust Whitey. Like, uh, the, the, the whole point of the episode is he trusts this guy, Joe, who instantly believes him and buys into everything he's saying despite it being insane. And it ends up being a problem because Joe is an extremist. And he's like, oh, I, I guess I shouldn't have trusted that white guy. I guess that the, the Muslim people, uh, the Sheik people, sorry, uh, the Russian guys and that Asian lady who's an air marshal were probably right. Oh, man. I guess I deserve to be beaten to death by an angry mob on an island. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, it was a pretty weak twist, and one where it say, was okay. Sure, everyone saw it coming that yeah, he's going to cause the crash. You're like, no shit, he's going to cause the crash. Because he's a guy who has to be right. And the other thing too is uh, it, during the Jordan Peele part where he kind of narrates and says it. The, the premise he gives is interesting because he, he kind of talks about how this is a man who's an investigative journalist. He will have to ask the right questions to possibly save this flight. I thought, oh, okay, it's going to be like an investigation thing where he has to investigate different key members of the flight, find out, okay, what's your role on this flight? What do you do? Have you forgotten to do anything? And then, you know, like just kind of question his way and logic his way through who causes the crash. He never does. Like, he just kind of runs around assaulting passengers. <laughs> Oh, and being a creep. Oh, he's a total creep in this. Uh, no, he, he's just all around not a likable character in this episode. Episode the, it's two. Yeah. Episode two, thank you. Uh, now, what were your thoughts of what would happen in episode three? That one was pretty simple, actually, because during the opening scenes, we have her bring out this old camera, and she explicitly says, this is the same camera that captured your baby steps. And then she rewinds back to in the diner, which is recording things. And I thought the twist, which... I think it's obvious is, oh, she's going to reveal my too far and realize that she took this godlike power too far and lost years of her life. And then, like, on top of that, we would also have this scene because the other trend of this episode is the cop shows up and kills her son in worse and worse ways every time she goes back. 
it would be a thing where like we cut to like 16 years later her son's going to co college he's, he's taking a different course in life completely they're not even at the same bar they're not even in the same city they're completely somewhere else and at the end of the episode that cop walks right up to the window again <laughs> No, you know, I mean, I, I was kind of, I, I agree with you. I was kind of hoping for the same thing, where she just goes so far back that either he's a kid again, that her son, is, a, who was about to go into college, is a kid again, or she's a kid again, because, I mean... Well, she didn't record herself. She recorded her son's baby steps. Well, the dad recorded her, but... It was dad's camera. They mentioned that. Yeah. But, you know, that would have been a more better twist, but, rather than I, just, yeah. I, I guess instead it's just a racism, like... Record the police. They can't do anything if they're being recorded. When this is guy is like very clearly like almost a time traveling cop who can show up anywhere and murder your son. <laughs> like this guy's basically the T2. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And episode three is fine. It's a it's too on the nose. And if this was like the 1950s, I'd say okay, sure, it's a progressive message. It was a different time. You had to be more obvious with your with your racial statements. Right. But th th this one is too on the nose. It feels They lay much. it on thick. They lay it on like, really like, thick. Like she has a five minute speech where she is laying out exactly what her point is and it's kind of belabored. Like, okay, yes, I get it. It's a race thing. Yes, Black Lives Matter. I get where you're going with this. Uh, now episode four. Episode four. Oh, that one I kind of liked a little more than uh, the other three. The, the episode four was the uh, jail cell one, right? Yeah, yeah, where John Chubb. No, uh, John Chubb. Uh, what? A Traveler. Oh, yeah. Where A Traveler... <laughs> that was actually one I liked the least, honestly. Really? Now, why is that? Um, well, again, the same problem as the previous ones. I had a more interesting twist in mind than they did. Mm. But uh, also because the ending is... Like, there's no real twist in this episode at all. It's just kind of a thing where, like, this guy's probably an alien. This guy's given a bunch of really fake names and he knows some really weird specific information. He's probably an alien. Then twist is, oh, he's an alien. No, I mean, we all... I mean... You saw that coming a mile away. The only thing that caught me off, off guard in this particular episode is the captain, uh, Captain Lane Pendleton. Oh, of, Pendleton. He, he was selling secrets to the Russians? I guess. Which, okay, yeah, that, that caught me matter. off guard. It didn't matter. It at didn't. All. Not even remotely. Like, But I was just thinking that's an interesting thing to give him. Like, uh, I mean, I guess he's supposed to be. Like, it's weird because him selling secrets to the Russians is actively against the character that's presented in the first part, which is that it he's, is. Yeah, he's he's xenophobic, he's hyper Christian, he demands to be the center of attention, and he loudly states how proud he is of his country, how much he loves his Christianity, and how much he loves Christmas. But of course, when that's all. When, when a protagonist is actively anti Christmas and kind of believes that Christmas is imposing on on the Inuit rights of the Alaskans and that the expansion to expansion the United States hurt her culture actively. Right. And the alien kind of capitalizes on that and uses kind of? that to his advantage. Uh, but, no, it's, uh, it's I, in my opinion, a better episode than the last three because, I don't know, I don't know. I, it, I, it's, not, it's not a good twice an episode, though. Like, it, it doesn't have much in the way of sci-fi elements. It doesn't have much in the way of a particularly interesting twist. It doesn't even have an interesting statement on humanity aside from people like hearing what they like to hear. <laughs> um, uh, the, the twist I was coming up with this one, though, was that he was like Santa Claus. Like, he, 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 he was a vindictive Santa Claus who was coming here to say, y'all are dicks. <laughs> Santa Claus. No, you know, I mean, that's, I can kind of see that because, one, they made a reference of, did this elf escape from the North Pole kind of ordeal? Yeah, like, like he escaped from the North Pole. He says, I came from the North Pole. It's not great. And then he says, oh, I got a Russian phone. And then he, the songs about Santa Claus are playing constantly through the episode, non-stop. And he says he's, he just came from the North Pole. So, he's Santa. He's Santa. Come on. Or I guess he's just an alien. Right. Who's tricking people. And has, like, mm, to put no effort into it. And, like, you he know, put, like, uh, that's my favorite part of the episode in, like, a so bad it's funny kind of way is that he puts no effort into his disguises. Like, he says, Oh, I'm with the Secret Service. It's like, Well, there's no information for the Secret Service. He's like, Oh, I mean, I'm, fr I'm from the Department of Revenue. There's no information. Right, he keeps service. changing the law. Oh, I'm actually a Russian. What? No, you're not. He keeps changing uh, the law. Uh, uh, I'm an alien. <laughs> And, you know, I mean, they even just make it so obvious halfway through the episode because he has antenna protruding from his head. And this is another one where I would have liked the concept that Jordan Peele presents, which is that 
uh, but the officer Yuka uh, is is very is very. Um, she needs to ask the right questions to figure out what's going on with with this mysterious visitor. But she doesn't really ask any questions. She no. kind of just demurs through this episode and kind of says, "Oh, you're going to take him out? Okay, I believe you." Which falls in line of you know, pride cometh before the fall. You know, she feels like she has the right answer. She knows what's going on right off the bat, and she was right about the alien. But, but she, she was right about him not being what he seemed, but. She was wrong about everything else, and the alien capitalized <laughs> on that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, let's it's, go it's, on to the fifth episode. Mr. President. My Wonderkin. God. Yeah, that guy had an ego. He had. He was so certain he could get the right candidate. Which he did. See, my, my problem with this episode is it didn't need to be an interesting twist either. Like It, it needed to be a twist as simple as the kid makes good policies. Yeah. Like the twist is, he's actually a good president. That's the only twist that needed to exist. Or the kid's actually a manipulative little son of a bitch, but... <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, that, that too. But either way, the, the problem with this episode is not the twist this time, because the twist is kind of unbelievable in the sense of, like... Like, the, the, the twist of this episode is, oh no, this kid's making real laws, he's making real changes, oh my god. Except it's established a few times early on that, well, no, there is a whole system of checks and balances, you do need to convince Congress to approve of this, and you need to make sure right. it's go through the court. Like, they set up the rules for that, and then ignore them, because apparently all of Congress and all of Senate agreed on the video games for everyone policy. Yeah, any notion of checks and, and balances apparently they exist out the window! And apparently they agreed on the no doctors over over 15 agreement as well. Which, what kind of dipshits are running the country? This isn't the problem with the kid. This is the problem with everybody else. <laughs> no. But the way the episode is framed is they believe that the campaign manager, he suddenly believes, oh, this kid is running America, not everybody around him, which is the case. Right. But I think that one of the twists would need to be, first off, that he that the campaign manager at some point needs to have a scene where he sits down, acknowledges, okay, if the kid wins, here's what we need to do. Or, like, he never thought about, what if the kid wins? He never thought about it. Like, it's just no. at some point, like, two weeks in, he's like, oh, shit, the kid won. Um, somebody needs to make sure he can't make laws. But at that point, it's too late, obviously. But, yeah, the, the only twist you need to make to make this show, episode interesting are, one, the kid makes uh, makes all these policies, and he makes good policies, and he's actually improving the country, despite his campaign manager believing that he's a tyrant. Or, two, this kid is somehow able to pass a law that makes him god king because he's so darn cute. Like, he somehow <laughs> manages to pass that law. And right. then we get the twist of, like, oh, no, a child doctor! Ah! But... This one kind of, like, there's a little bit of subtext there. It also reads as a Those Damn Millennials episode. It does. It totally does. No. We're, we're like, ah, they're changing everything. And they're going to make babies doctors. And they're going to give everyone free video games. Those darn irresponsible millennials. Why can't anyone else see how bad these millennials are? Total jab at younger generations. And also, it's also that exaggerated, uh... It's an old man episode. Yeah, it's the exaggerate. It, it's totally an old man episode. Um, no, it's just uh, this exaggerated notion of the underdog, except this underdog came back to bite its handler in the ass. <laughs> and like, the, this is one where, okay, this is another one of those episodes where I talked about this a little bit ago, where every time that they that they someone does something singular, we're told it's brilliant, but the example we're given is that it's retarded. Uh, oh, like, totally. Like, like, for example, um, during that episode, there's a scene where the little kid goes into a debate and gets absolutely destroyed because, of course, he did. Yeah. And the show plays it straight. Like, oh, man, he got destroyed. And, like, the campaign manager's like, how did I not see this comic? Like, like yeah, dude, he's wondering 11. kid, you <laughs> he's, 11, that. he's 11 years old. Yeah, he's going to get destroyed. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> how dumb is your character? But... But then, the, the, the dumb part is, after we're given this dose of reality of, oh yeah, this is operating by real world rules, and this has to be a real world thing, then we get a turnaround of, well, what if he makes a, a, a sad video about his dog dying of cancer, and then that immediately wins him the election. Like, well, no, no. That's not how that works. You just established that people have like actual values and are intelligent in this universe, except when they're not. Right. And it's one where you very clearly had a writer who had like the bullet points of what happens and then just jumps to the bullet points and doesn't actually do the groundwork to get them set up. No, no. It, and, you know, this is like you said in the American recut and in Us. 
Jordan Peele is very good at building the first two thirds of his. Uh, okay, I, I'm going to disagree with that idea that this is a Jordan Peele problem because this is one where every act of that episode doesn't work. This because, is true. Like, like in the first act, we established that he's a loser who's down on his luck, but he wants to get this kid a decent campaign, get him kind of far, but not that far because his end goal is just look, I got a kid all the way to the primaries. I am good at my job, but then they went through the episode. He forgets that his goal is to get the kid to the primaries and have him collapse, and then yeah, he forgets that and says, "I'm a failure because I got a kid to the primaries," and he collapsed. And then it turns around again and says, "No, wait, I'm a genius because even though we're operating by real world rules of politics and having to go out of our way to establish that, I can also save this kid's campaign by doing cartoonishly silly things." Also, on a side note. That general was so easily willing to oblige his only, every whim of that kid. His only line is, he's the president. I follow the president. And if you don't follow the president, it's treason. <laughs> he's right. The general's absolutely right. It's a thing like, yeah, my job is to follow the president. He's the president. I'm going to follow the president. <laughs> uh, during the scene with the golf balls where the kid's saying, like, you got to play by my rules and I get to see what the rules are, or else you're there, there's a little bit of an on-the-nose statement about a certain Cheeto in charge. <clears throat> oh, yeah, 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 a certain uh, commander and creep, if you will. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit too on-the-nose. Oh, maybe totally. Maybe roll, roll nice to say, okay, yeah, you don't like Trump, got it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, an infantile tyrant in the White House. Oh. And, and, and he's running around knocking stuff over and saying, you have to follow my rule because I'm the president. Mm -hmm. uh, episode 6, uh, The Journey to Mars. Uh, this is one where in the first the first few moments of the episode, my first my internal thoughts were, why are they introducing the concept of humanity to us? We, we probably know what humans are. Right. We're humans. Okay, so we have a document where we're establishing this is what Earth is. This is what, Earth, what humans are. Humans are in danger. They're going to go to Mars. And I'm like, okay, there's a reason you're telling me this. It's probably aliens who are watching Earth and seeing what's happening. And then right. the twist was aliens are watching Earth and seeing what happens in a simulation. I mean, they do they do try except to approach the, it. Except for the guy that brings out the simulation and is, like, naked on the ground, like... What? Where's his clothes? Where's his clothes? They did a total Matrix right there. But, I mean, they... Sort of? Except, like, they break the rules of the Matrix, too, because it's apparently, like, they're in, like, 15 different simulations of how this could go, except this guy broke out of his simulation and became a real boy and <laughs> just showed up there. <laughs> like, what are the rules for that? How does that work? I don't know. No, I mean, and I kind of like this episode a little better, personally, because, you know, they did kind of subtly say... Was aliens? Well, they didn't lay it as thick as they did in the other episodes. That's the only thing I'll say about that. Uh, yeah, I think that they did foreshadow it, and they did put in things that foreshadowed this. But they kiboshed it as well. Which is better than every other episode where they actually foreshadow the twist. Right. No, they make the person who was actually right. It wasn't a good twist. But totally insane. Twist. Right, no, it was a, it was a better twist in contrast to the other episodes, which totally blew. Uh, well, I don't, I can't say totally blue because I did like some of episode four. But See, the, the the problem, the problem I approach this episode with is while it's better in a nuts and bolts sense, and even in an effect sense, because they have like an actual full environment they they're in, they establish the rules of the environment. We get to see that, yeah, there's actually, like, a full set built for this place. Right. And we have some, some effects here and there to see, here like, the there. stars. We see, like, some sci-fi stuff. Clearly, they threw a lot of budget at this episode. And it has, like, some actual, like, writing in it. You know, where, like, we see, like, okay, yeah, they actually are establishing that. Uh, there is this AI that nobody trusts. Uh, th there is this weird thing where the thing like whoops out of the the, the, the thing for a second. Oh yeah! <laughs> uh, the, the guy's like not finding these crystal things that should be on the toilets. Like, and then they dig through the toilet themselves. Well, yeah, because after that point, he's already said, "Up, oh, these are the problems with the simulation," and they fix the problems with the simulation. And yeah, the, the problem I have is the episode itself. Like, what was? the actual episode about, aside from the simulation twist. 
trying to get back, trying to get to Mars, even though Earth is gone. I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like it's it's a suicide mission from day one. So it's totally, to, it's supposed to be like a little mini drama about the crew members and how like, the captain is getting way too upside. How like some crew members are trying to bang each other. And you couldn't. Except you, except I can't remember any of what happened. And I just watched it like yesterday. Yeah, me too. Well, I watched it today, and I was still like I'm still like trying to unpack what was what happened because I mean, like you said, tension between the crew. Now, you could have showed that without nuking Earth, but... Well, well, no, like, the, the whole tension of the episode is we need to get to Mars, where the last people are alive, and Earth has been nuked. But as for, like, the actual uh, intricacies of that kind of drama, things like the interpersonal relationships, the, the ways that their emotions clash, the ways that people go, go off the rails, these kinds of things that make these movies work, or shows work, they don't do much of the groundwork there. They're focused too much on the twist in this one. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. are. Which, <laughs> this is a twist that feels like it's out of an old Twilight Zone episode, which is, uh, it was Earth all along. Or oh, the aliens really were a us. Yeah, that kind of spiel. Um, but now, speaking of that's all other versions of the Twilight Zone, uh, you saw the original 1950s Twilight Zone. I have gone back and watched some of the 1950s Twilight Zones. Uh, and uh, first of all, no, the show doesn't hold up. I don't care what you say. The, the, the old episodes are kind of garbage. <laughs> now, why is that? Uh, because a lot of times there are like these really dumb twists. Like, there's at least three episodes in the early er, er, season where the twist is they were going to Earth. Like the one where um, where they're testing these hydrogen bombs, and this guy's like, "Well, if they test these hydrogen bombs, we're all going to die. I'm going to hijack one of these space planes and go to space and find a new planet to live on." And then, like, when they're in the space plane going there with, like, the family and friends, he says, we're going to go to this planet next in the soul system called Earth. Hmm. And, like, that's the whole twist is they're going to Earth. That, that's and, so stupid, actually. And, <laughs> and like, the, the, there's the episode, the famous one, where uh, the, the guy, the guy uh, goes to the apocalypse, wakes up, and he's like, I have all the time in the world to read. And then he crunches his glasses. It's like, no, I had so much time. But that was also an episode where the rule of the universe is that everybody hates him for reading. Like, nobody likes that he's so avidly a reader. Like, the, the, he is somebody who's an outcast from the world because he reads books. Even the cosmos took a piss out of my... But, the, yeah, anyways. Glasses. Anyways, um, I think that if we were to compare the episodes from the current one versus the old ones, the old ones kind of hold up better. Because the current ones don't have some of the basic interesting parts of like the sci-fi stories and the sci-fi elements that held them up. Because mm. new ones are a lot of times in modern day or attempting to be Black Mirror, but without any of the budget. Now I saw Black Mirror, I didn't see the original Twilight series, I mean I saw a few episodes here and there and I don't quite remember the whole premise of each episode, but uh... It's about a vampire and a teenage girl. Oh, oh the Twilight Zone, I'm sorry, the original. I saw the original Twilight Zone. God, not to be confused with that horrible Twilight franchise. <laughs> Which one? The fanfic has been... Uh, never mind. No, yeah, semantics. <laughs> anyway, uh, but, but I definitely enjoy Black Mirror more. Yeah, I, I went through all the episodes, talked about my take on the twists. Uh, I, I think that the general problem you can take from that, if you care at this point, is... Um, a lot of times the twists are pretty uninspired or they're so far out of left field that you just don't care about the twist because it wasn't foreshadowed. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times there's a problem of, we said it's brilliant so it must be brilliant when you as audience are saying, well, this is really lame. Like, he, he they, they, they say in the first episode that this comedian's jokes are too intelligent for the audience, but when you watch it, they're just too unfunny for the audience. Very. Uh, some episodes are too on the nose with their points. They lay it on thick. They uh, do. Yeah, I, I think that overall this this series' biggest hurdle is writing problems. I agree. And it's Twilight Zone. You can't get by without good writing. Like we said, if right. you're a fan of sci-fi, then go by all means watch it, but don't expect a whole lot of good writing. Alright, so let's get into the, the finale which I believe you just started to get into but let's really worry it into our big summers for each of us go ahead uh, Brennan what is your take on the Twilight Zone reboot and would you recommend spending the time to watch it through as it is the, I find the whole series to be mediocre and really you're just better off with Black Mirror that's just my take um <laughs> Uh, yeah, likewise, I think that uh, a lot of the points I've listed out are real problems 
it doesn't have the writing to hold up. I think that with Jordan Peele's influence, it has some really good camera work here and there, and it does have some moments where the effects really work in its favor. But even though it does have some things that it does well, it doesn't hold a candle to Black Mirror. And you're definitely better off with a time investment to Black Mirror, which is a few seasons in, versus this Twilight Zone, which is just getting started and doesn't seem to have learned any lessons from Black Mirror. No. All right. Well, this has been the this is the ramble on end. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>